easy does it. Whether it's Fed rate hikes or China letting up on COVID restrictions or steering clear of a rail strike. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, special contributor Larry Summers on the jobs numbers and Chair Powell's take on inflation. Mike Arrogetti of Aries Management on the remarkable growth in private credit. Private credit has tended to outperform when rates are going up. And Tom Montag and Ann Finucan on their new TPG venture into the world of carbon credits. We saw an opportunity to improve the whole market. It was a week of searching for the happy medium as China began the week in an uproar over COVID restrictions, put in perspective by former U.S. Ambassador to China, Gary Locke. This is uh, clearly uh, uh, the worst since Tiananmen Square. But things ended the week a bit more calm for China after authorities signaled some easing in the COVID policy, as urged by World Bank President David Malpass. I think they could use a recalibration, more targeting of their, of their lockdowns. We started the week with a looming rail strike, but President Biden and Congress sought to calm things down by stepping in and imposing a deal on the parties. The U.S. House is passing the bill to avert the strike by those freight rail workers. And consumers seem to be seeking their own happy medium as they started their holiday shopping. It was a kind of a muted uh, Black Friday. You know, it was um, uh, solid uh, customer traffic uh, overall, but not strong. All of which brought us to Fed Chair Powell, who struck a balance, or at least tried to, between raising rates too much and not raising them enough. We need to raise interest rates to a level that is sufficiently restrictive to return inflation to 2%. There's considerable uncertainty about what rate will be sufficient. But then the U.S. job numbers came in on Friday, and there was nothing moderate about those. 263,000 jobs created in November, and employers are paying more for every one of them, with average hourly wages up a whopping 0.6% month over month, and that's 5.1% up year over year. The markets took a look at all this and didn't like it one bit. That's at least at first. But by the end of the day on Friday, had settled back down. And overall, the S&P 500 gained over 1% for the week. And the Nasdaq was up over 2%. While the yield on the 10-year fell to under 3.5% for the week after starting out at nearly 37 Here to help us sort through this all, we welcome now Greg Peters back to Wall Street Week, co-CIO for fixed income at PGM, And Christina Hooper, welcome back from Invesco. She's chief market strategist there. So, Christina, let me start with you. I, I think that uh, Jay Powell was trying to calm things down, uh, but I'm not sure he accomplished that. He did not accomplish that, but that's the market's fault, not his fault. I think he was very clear uh, in telling us what we already knew, uh, which is that the Fed is likely to downshift to 50 basis points in December, but the terminal rate is very unclear, and we have a ways to go in terms of taming inflation. Really, the only positive was around housing and talking about uh, the rolling over there. Uh, but other than that, I think he was a, a straight shooter uh, about setting the table for what uncertainty there is in terms of, of where the terminal rate is and where the Fed pauses. But, Greg, he also set the table for being really concerned about wage inflation because he talked about the really dislocation, particularly in the jolts numbers. And then those numbers came in on Friday and were exactly what he was hoping would not happen, I think. Yeah, so the strong non-farm payroll report and the recent economic data actually is a blunt reminder, actually, that the data are in charge. So it doesn't matter if you're a pundit, portfolio manager, or even Fed Chair Powell, uh, it's all driven by the data. So for him or anyone to proclaim that, you know, rate rises are pausing or pivoting, it's just really kind of a fool's errand because you're driven by the data. And the data is what's driving the Fed uh, uh, and should drive the markets. Absolutely. If, if you don't mind my adding, back in June, the Fed communicated that it was going to only hike by 50 basis points. Then two data points came out within days of the Fed meeting. We got um, CPI, we got uh, Michigan inflation expectations, and they pivoted to 75 basis points. So Greg is absolutely right. The data is going to drive this, and that really renders Powell's speech pretty irrelevant. So, so Greg, if the data are driving the Federal Reserve, what's driving investors? If you're an investor, what do you make of these data, and where do you go? 
Well, you know, it is this circular reference problem that we have. It, it's 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 clear to me, at least, that the markets are focusing less on the data and more on what the Fed has to say. The challenge, I think, is that the rhetoric coming out of the Fed uh, is quite disparate and all over the place. So the messaging uh, is quite mixed. But to me, it's really hard for me to swallow that, you know, rates have rallied, risk assets have uh, also rallied, um, and we haven't even seen a recession yet, and we haven't seen the peak in rates. And we've had one data print, David, uh, of, of lower uh, and lower inflation. So you're a fixed income guy, <laughs> Greg. Uh, what do you do in fixed income, given that circumstance? Yeah, so I think it's been this, this, this obviously very difficult market for fixed income. If you think about where the 10-year started, this endeavor post-COVID, it was 50 basis points, right? So I know we're at three and a half now. I do think yields move higher here as we reprice more rate hikes. But I have to tell you, uh, you know, we, we've repriced to such a dramatic degree that I see a tremendous amount of value fixed income. Yields higher, all else equal, is a good thing. Spreads wider, all else equal, a good thing. So while we can't time it, I feel really bullish on the outlook for fixed income. Christina, how about you? What do you see for investors right now? Where should they be going? Well, I think investors should remain relatively defensive, but recognize that we are likely to see improvement and a more risk on environment when we get more clarity, certainly when we when markets can tell that there is an imminent Fed pause. Uh, before then, there'll be volatility, though. So being defensive, um, investment grade credit um, looks attractive, um, more defensive equities. Um, but then also waiting um, for that, uh, that pivot, um, investment grade credit should actually um, hold investors through as, but as they take on more risk in other asset classes. So, so this is an, a time to be well diversified, but more defensive but in the that, near term. Does that mean that in order to be able to pivot, you want Want to be pretty liquid so you can jump back in when you on a moment's notice well you certainly want to have some level of liquidity but at the same time uh, humans are notoriously bad at, at market mm -hmm. timing so i'm um, thinking about building positions for the longer term starting to dollar cost average in sooner rather than later uh, greg in the in the in the fixed income area one of the things we hear a lot about these days is private credit we're going to have mike arrogati on a little bit later in this program and some people are saying look given the fact that the interest rates are going up that means uh, equities are somewhat less attractive because of the discount rate that private credit is really attractive because you can get some very high yields in the fixed income space well you can but you can get higher yields in public fixed income um i think if you look at what's been happening over the past decade or so, there's just been this tsunami of investment in private credit. So if you look at one of the excesses of the zero negative interest rate policy, I think private credit is front and center. So we have a lot more concerns around the private credit market. There's a lot more leverage in that market. Uh, it's a non-market market market, uh, 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 market as well. Uh, and so it's a don't ask, don't tell type of policy there. So to me, uh, the relative value that we see is clearly in public fixed income. Uh, and it's also important to reiterate that there's a lot more leverage uh, uh, in the, uh, the private credit market than there is the public. At the same time, it's shorter term, isn't it? Isn't it shorter duration so you can get any out? Yeah, and also so is uh, floating rate, I think, right, Greg? Yeah, a lot of it's floating rate, but it's also highly dependent upon the investor and the sponsor putting money in, right? Because these are such levered capital structure, uh, if in fact we do have this uh, recession that everyone's forecasting for 2023, uh, you know, that requires a lot more flexibility, a lot more collateral and cash calls into the company. So uh, it's really uh, incumbent upon the sponsors uh, who hold all the cards to whether that company uh, kind of survives or not. And that's not necessarily a, uh, a great place to sit. So, Christina, most of us retail investors are not going to be able to participate in the huge private credit. If I'm a retail investor, what makes sense for me in order to have the flexibility that you want, but at the same time be somewhat defensive? So I think being very well diversified, have some alt exposure, and there are actually even ways to, to have access to things like private credit. I, I think what's, what we learned from 2022 
is that it is very important to have a broad array of, of investments in, in equities, fixed income, and alt. Um, particularly attractive uh, right now, as I said, is investment great credit. Uh, also, I favor dividend paying stocks in this kind of environment. Um, but we're going to have to recognize that in the near term, there should be significant volatility. So some lower correlating asset classes within the alt space um, could make a difference. Do you have to have a possible recession in the back of your mind, Christina? Uh, so I think we'll be able to avoid a recession. If we do have a recession, it should be relatively modest and brief. Um, so we could see an environment in which an economic recovery begins to unfold by the end of 2023. Do you agree with that, Greg, briefly? Uh, I have a slightly more negative view, but nonetheless, even if it's a soft landing, a shallow recession, or a deep recession, the contours are very different. So just the kind of blithely blithely and blindly kind of add on risk, I don't think is the right way to play it. I think right. what you'll see, David, is a right. tremendous amount of differentiation and dispersion right. yep. as some segments of the economy, yep. some sectors are hit harder than others. And I think that's the important piece. Thank you so much to Vesco's Christina Hooper uh, and PGM's Greg Peters. Coming up, Bank of America veterans Tom Montag and Ann Finucane join Wall Street Week for an exclusive explanation of their brand new carbon credit venture backed by TPG. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Global Wall Street got some big news this week as two of its most prominent citizens, Tom Montag, the former COO of Bank of America, and Ann Finucane, the former vice chair of Bank of America, got together and announced a big new venture backed in part by TPG and involves carbon credits. We're delighted to say to welcome them now to Wall Street Week for an exclusive discussion about this new venture. So thank you very much, Ann and Tom, for being here. Ann, let me start with you. You're the chair of this new venture. Explain where it came from. How long have you been working on this? Thanks, David, and good to be here. So uh, this is an evolution, actually, of work that Tom and I did at Bank of America uh, for our own company, but also for our clients, where as more and more companies are looking to become carbon neutral, which is the first step in becoming net zero, they do an audit, they review what they can do, and there's a delta between everything they could do and uh, what is carbon neutrality. And the, the sort of basic practice has been to fill in that delta for the short term with carbon credits. But they are not plentiful. They have had some controversy around them because looking back, uh, they've uh, not been well vetted and they may not be uh, as, as, um, as good as they could be. So we saw an opportunity to improve the whole market, one, to fulfill what clients need to put money into the developing world, uh, in other words, cash into protecting forests uh, for uh, uh, removal as well. So this is carbon reduction, carbon renewal, carbon removal. And uh, in order to do that, we needed to set up a system that would be uh, much more, I think, acceptable to not only companies, but to the NGO world. So what I'm talking about is that these credits would be uh, vetted uh, through proprietary uh, quality guardrails. They would have third-party uh, ratings. It would be a methodology, a methodology that's transparent. And so people could feel comfortable with this new product. So, so Tom, you're going to be the CEO of this. You've spent a career, really, in and around the markets, whether at Goldman Sachs or at Bank of America. Are you making a market in these carbon credits? Is that the way it's going to be? You're putting together people who put them together with the people who need them? We're making a market in the sense, David, that we're actually, you know, we're offering a product that they can buy. Uh, it's not yet a tradable product. Uh, at some point, it may be, but at this point, you know, we, as Ann said, we're, we just we have we've established Rubicon Carbon kind of solutions company, and the first product we have is what we call Rubicon Carbon Tons. And that is what we are offering to in enterprises around the country. Well, tell us what's in that Rubicon to Carbon Ton when it's available. What is in there? So what, what we've done is that, you know, our, our three words, if you go to our website, rubiconcarbon.com, uh, are scale, confidence, and innovation. And so we basically have already purchased a number of uh, carbon credits, and we sell them to you in, in a basically a portfolio. And the port there's two different portfolios. There'll be a third 
uh, and they'll probably be more over time. We have a nature-based portfolio and an emissions-based portfolio, and we'll have it a removables. And each one of those underlying those Rubicon carbon tons in nature has numerous projects that we've already purchased, and we curate constantly. So we, we've hired uh, Dr. Jen Jenkins as our chief sustainability officer. And not only do we look at them when they come in, but we're always looking at and curating what's in there. So you would buy the right to retire carbon credits in the portfolio of your choice uh, at any time that you wish. So, Ann, do you essentially certify that, in fact, these credits exist and that they're legitimate? You and I have talked in the past about things like greenwashing. Does this address that problem right. to some extent? And do you need the government to certify it? Well, let's just go back here for a minute. I think the problem with carbon credits is more um, retrospective than it is current. Retrospectively, uh, it, it was a nascent industry early on, small players, and um, standards were not set. So, yeah, in some que uh, places they were questionable. But today we have much more transparency. We're working with NGOs. We uh, not only will work with those that certify and verify today, we're essentially taking another step and we are doing our own project level diligence. So this is sort of an insurance on top of an insurance. And actually to, beyond that, we're gonna be doing some work in terms of insurance itself and risk management. So if you were a client and you came to us, I think that you would have much more confidence. First of all, the projects themselves are forward looking, not retrospective. We recognize what the issues were in, in the years gone by. We're not buying uh, renewable projects in OECD countries, meaning we're not trying to uh, make renewables in America, which are actually cheaper and easy to get to part of the credit basket. What we are doing is looking to uh, the developing world to help, and I think everybody needs removables. So we'll be transparent, we'll be easy to use. The credits are uh, verified, certified, and we're taking a second look at them through uh, Jen Jenkins' group. I think that this is a sort of end-to-end -end process. We, we're working with developers, we're working with brokers, and we may actually source credits ourselves in the years to come. Okay, Tom Montag and Ann Finucane will be staying with us as we turn to what comes next and how far Rubicon Carbon could take us all. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We are talking with Ann Finucane and Tom Montag about their new venture, Rubicon Carbon. So, Ann, let me come back to you and talk about the future of this business, as it, as it were. How big is the bread box? Well, let's just talk about how big is the need. Uh, by any dimension, we are looking at a need, a delta of three and a half to four trillion dollars a year needed to create a net zero world by 2050. And uh, the scientists, the NGOs, governments would like to see us get halfway there by 2030, so or at least 45%. There just simply isn't enough money to do that uh, in the current equation. Governments can't do it, philanthropy can't do it, and businesses are really not set up to do it. You will see more of that in the years to come, but we're talking about $4 trillion a year that is needed to fill this delta. Meanwhile, through uh, some commitments that have been made, you know, about 90% of the world is committed to some form of net zero, but the um, Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, otherwise known as GFANS, is a collection of 500 financial firms who have committed to be net zero. For financial firms to be net zero, all of their clients have to be net zero. That means not just big corporates, but middle market companies, small businesses, and ultimately consumers. So imagine that kind of um, task ahead of us to help yeah. clients and customers become first carbon uh, neutral, ultimately net zero. Uh, Tom, that's exactly what I wanted to ask you about, because you and Ann worked on green financing when you were at Bank of America. If a Rubicon Carbon had existed when you were doing that, how would it have made your life different, and how will it really interact in general with banks? I saw, by the way, Bank of America, I think, is an investor. 
That's right. They, they are an investor. I, I think it, what we what Ann was just saying is that we think this product allows people us allows people to get at scale financing more frequently, and so we're hoping through Rubicon. Uh, carbon capital that we'll be able to bring as much money as is necessary to help solve the problem. And David, the other thing is when you look at Rubicon carbon tons, it reminded me of the, the more liquid and the more uh, people are able to invest in a simple manner, the more money comes into a product. And I, I always looked at it as I looked at the derivative market back then. The derivative, when I was in the beginning of the derivative market, it was a very bilateral, not tradable market. And its growth largely came from the fact that people got together and had standard agreements and masters and did all the kinds of things to make the market more liquid, which brought more money into uh, that that market. We hope by doing what we're doing now, we bring more money in to help solve some of the problems. And how do you make money? How does Rubicon Carbon make money and in success? Let's assume this all works perfectly. Where do you get your money from? Well, there's a, a margin, if you will, on um, what we package for our clients. So that's how you make the money. And it is certainly less expensive for them than uh, keeping an entire staff on on, um, on call within their own operations. And it's completely unrealistic if you uh, go down uh, the food chain to middle, small market, and uh, small businesses and, and consumers. So we'll make um, a fee for, for our services. I think that relative to what it would cost somebody to set something up, it will be de minimis. And this is really out of work that I, I want to sort of make a point about two different worlds that are uh, coming together unexpectedly. In the NGO space, out of COP27, it was clear to the NGO um, community that we need to be able to find sources of funding that doesn't currently exist. And if the carbon credit market can be more transparent, the product's clearer, more forward thinking, the people involved uh, with, on the one hand, good um, financial background, but also understanding what the issues uh, that the NGO world has, then that's uh, for them a very good thing. And I think we will supply that. On the, on the other side, we have um, Jim Coulter, Hank Paulson, Mark McDinsky, and others who pull together rise climate and raise seven and a half billion dollars for uh, new investment in new technologies for this very same issue. So you have an investing community that's interested, interested, you have an NGO community that's interested, and you have a client base that needs the help. And Tom, you said earlier, this is not a true exchange where you're not really trading in these carbon credits. Do you envision a world where you do create an exchange? How far are we away from that world? That's a great question, David. I, I do believe at some point, given the, the, the volume that has to be done, that there will be an exchange of some of some sort where we can buy and sell a standardized product. Again, remember, these are retired, uh, kind of like a maturity, I guess, of a swap or a bond. And so there will be trading, I think, at some point. I don't think we're really that close to that, but can I see that in the next three to five years? Yeah, I can see that happening. I think we're all hoping that we can establish uh, a price for carbon, but it's, it's in these kinds of activities that we'll be able to do it because it needs to scale and it needs to be something that is more understandable to the financial markets. Tom, you've dealt with exchanges a lot as a trader and otherwise. Uh, are there things you've learned that you would apply here, you could do it better? Um, I think, well, I th certainly my experiences are gonna help uh, help us establish something that people will will want to work on and work with us on. And so hopefully together as an industry, we can get something together that people want to standardize and then want to trade in a, in a liquid fashion. And that liquidity always brings in more money, which is the scale part of this. Well, speaking for myself, I find it very exciting and we'll be really curious to see how it develops. Thank you so much for sharing with us. That's Tom Montag and Ann Finucane of Rubicon Carbon. Coming up, we're going to explore the large and growing world of private credit with Mike Arigetti of Aries Management. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Credit. It's what makes the business world go round. And years of fiscal and monetary stimulus have made sure there's plenty of credit to go around. But now the Fed and other central banks would like there to be just a little less lending so we can get inflation down. History cautions strongly against 
prematurely loosening policy, we will stay the course until the job is done. Which is hitting deals, particularly when it comes to private equity. What affects deal making is uncertainty. Uncertainty is the enemy of deal making. But it turns out that as the government regulates lending from the banks more, the world of private credit has exploded. The more you regulate parts of the financial system, the money tends to flow to the unregulated parts of the financial system. Having all that credit going on outside of the regulated uh, part of the economy is not ideal. But that leaves the question whether private credit will be able to step in as the banks pull back. Private credit is really important, but uh, private credit has also pulled back a little bit, not because of uh, the availability of, of financing or because they are stuck with uh, bad loans like some of the large banks are, but because of the enormous uncertainty. And to take us into this large and growing world of private credit, we welcome now one of the leaders in the area. He is Mike Arrighetti, CEO of Aries Management. So, Mike, thank you so much. Welcome to Wall Street Week. Great to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank we you. hear so much about private credit these days and how big it is, how big it's gotten. Give us your sense of just how big it is right now and why it's gotten this big. So when we talk about private credit, let me just zoom out quickly. We're talking about lending that is happening outside of the banking system, and that could be in corporate, real estate, infrastructure, consumer. Uh, I think a lot of the recent dialogue that, that folks are paying attention to is more along the opportunity in corporate lending. That's the most evolved and the most developed market, both here in the U.S. and globally. In terms of sizing, no one quite knows, just because a lot of this is in private hands, but order of magnitude, the private credit market for corporates in the U.S. is about $1 trillion. Juxtapose that with CNI loans in the banking system, that's about two to two and a half times that, uh, and almost at parity in terms of size with the leverage loan and high yield market. So what effect is the increased in interest rates had on the private credit business? Obviously, it's affecting a lot of business right now. It's harder to get loans. If you can get them at all, they're more expensive. Yeah, I think private credit has tended to outperform when rates are going up for two main reasons. Number one, the structure of the loans are short duration and floating rate, though they typically reprice every 30 to 90 days. So as rates are going up, the return is going up. Um, that obviously in an environment where we're seeing a lot of volatility in the equity markets and valuations are challenged in the high grade markets, private credit is a place where people can actually go to benefit from, from rising rates. The, the flip side of that, obviously, is that as rates are going up, debt service becomes more challenging for leveraged borrowers. And so part of the conversation today is, as you're generating this excess return, at what point does the incremental uh, interest rate challenge the companies? I would say as we sit here today, uh, still really strong fundamental economic performance within the portfolios and not any signs of stress really making their way through as a result of the rate hike. Mike, just pick up on a couple of things you said there, because I talked to one investor who said, you know, there's no such thing as truly bulletproof in business, but these are close to it. And I guess it's because of the two things you mentioned, the short duration and also the fact you've got floating rates. So if interest rates go up, you're protected. Well, I hope that person you spoke to is an Aries investor already, but if they're not, I hope they're watching this show. Uh, I, bulletproof is always something that you don't want to talk about in investing, but I would agree at this point in the cycle, private credit is, is a good place to be. Floating rate, as we said, short duration, but also senior secured. So if you think about where these exposures sit in a company's balance sheet or relative to the value of an asset, uh, today most private credit loans are sitting in the top half of the capital structure, which means that there's institutional equity supporting those loans um, dollar for dollar. So there's a significant amount of equity valuation that would have to deteriorate before you begin to have a conversation about principal loss on, on private credit. Mike, you mentioned uh, Aries Investors, and I wonder whether you're having, if anything, an easier time in getting investors these days because interest rates going up necessarily affect the value of equities just because of the discount rate. It makes it less attractive. Has private credit has become more attractive relative to equities as an alternative investment? I think so. You know, in, in Aries manages close to $350 billion of assets globally, and we have funds that we offer across the alternative spectrum, including private equity. Uh, I would say as a general observation, investor appetite for 
door play equity product is pretty muted right now, simply because, as you point out, valuations are challenged. And if you think about the drivers of return in that market, earnings growth is going to be muted. Availability of leverage is, is difficult. Cost of capital is high. So uh, private credit does offer some pretty attractive relative value. Uh, and I think going into this part of the cycle, a lot of institutional and retail investors were under allocated to private credit. And so when they're grappling with the denominator effect from valuation deterioration in the public equity market and the high grade market, private equity is probably where you're feeling it the most. I think the private credit markets, people are still under allocated. So even though their alternative allocation may be lower, they're able to continue to allocate through that. I've read also, Mike, that the size of the loans is going up. You can handle much larger loans than you did, say, five, 10 years ago. Absolutely right. I mean, one of the biggest drivers of the growth in private credit in the U.S. and now globally was just bank consolidation and the increase in size in the public market. So if viewed through that lens, as banks have consolidated, it's more difficult for them to service smaller borrowers. And as the public debt and public equity markets have grown and moved towards larger borrowers as well, there's just a much greater white space for private credit and private equity for that matter to come in with larger capital solutions. So as that opportunity set has grown and as folks like us have scaled capital, the average uh, investment size has absolutely increased. Um, just to put that in perspective, when we started this business 20 plus years ago, uh, a good sized borrower in this market was probably $25 million of EBITDA um, cash flow. And today, uh, average cash flow in our portfolios is probably pushing $150 million. How much of the growth of private credit has been because uh, the banks have been more regulated? They have had to move back out of that space. And I guess the follow on to that is do you see a prospect of more regulation coming from Washington as private credit's gotten so big? Yeah, I think that's a little bit of a, I don't want to say a false narrative, but a, a misunderstanding of what's been driving the growth of these markets. So bank consolidation is really the primary factor. So if you look at the evolution of private equity and private credit over the last 20 to 25 years, it really started with the consolidation of the middle market bank landscape into the, the big money center bank. Uh, so if you look today, there are 50% of the number of banks in the US than there were 20 years ago. As a result of that, what one may have expected, which was that all of this capacity would have you know, stayed in the system. The larger banks are now focused on larger borrowers and, and more liquid parts of the business. The regulatory overlay is less about regulation of the banks and really more about the regulatory capital framework uh, and the profitability of this business on bank balance sheets. One thing that I think is misunderstood by most is that the banks are still very active participants in and around the private equity and private credit landscape. They're just attaching to the business in a different way, lending money to folks like Aries, supporting the buyout business through the syndication of loans. So they're still very, very active. I just think that they've moved away from being primary holders of middle market credit, which you know, I actually think makes sense. And finally, Mike, where does the next leg of growth come for Aries and for private credit more generally? Is it taking more market share away from banks? Is it moving into new areas? I know Aries is in the United States, also to some extent in Europe, not in Asia. Yeah, we're seeing uh, what I would call horizontal and, and vertical growth. So geographically, we've been expanding into Europe over the last 15 years and now have a meaningful private credit business across the Eurozone. Uh, we are now meaningfully growing our business across the Asia Pacific region. So there will be geographic expansion as these markets continue to evolve along a similar trajectory with a lot of the same trends that we saw in the US. There are also new markets that are opening as, as institutional investors are being more attracted to private credit and the private market ecosystem is growing. We're seeing opportunities in places like infrastructure lending, real estate credit, alternative credit. So I, I think we're still in the early stages of the development of these markets. And my expectation would be if we can continue to demonstrate durable performance through cycles, then the appetite for the asset class will, will continue to grow quite significantly. Mike, thank you so much for joining us on Wall Street Week. That is Mike Aragetti. He's CEO of Aries Management.
Coming up, we wrap up the week with our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We're joined now once again by our very special contributor to Wall Street Week. He is Larry Summers of Harvard. So, Larry, I have to say, until Friday, I thought the big story was going to be what Jay Powell had to say. And then those jobs numbers came in. And obviously, the number of jobs was really impressive, but also the average hourly wage. Wow. Look, what we saw was a 7.5% annual rate wage increase for the month, a 6% wage increase for the last three months, and a 5% increase for the year. So it's high and it's rising. And the labor market is strong. And we're still in unprecedented territory in terms of the gap between vacancies and jobs. And I think that what that's got to tell you is that we got a long way to go to get an inflation down where the Fed has said that it wants it uh, to be. We don't know where this is, how this is all going to play out. but. For my money, the best single measure of core underlying inflation is to look at wages. Uh, it's interesting. That's what Paul Krugman uh, acknowledged uh, today when he said that he was shaken in his views by uh, these numbers. And I think what this is telling us is that the Fed's got a long way uh, to go. So how is that going to happen? I mean, we heard Jay Powell talk about the jolts numbers, for example, say we've got a big gap between the people trying to get people to work and the people actually working. As long as you have that, you've got this pressure. He said we've got to get demand down so that, in fact, we are not seeking as many people in the workforce. But how does that get done? It's not getting done yet. It's not getting done yet. And what that says is we're probably going to need increases in interest rates. I suspect they're going to need more increases in interest rates than the market is now judging or than they're now saying. Look, every, every time they revise their forecast of inflation up and they regard, revise their forecast of ultimate unemployment up as well. And gosh, we've all been at the airport and they say it's leaving at 7.30 and then they say it's leaving at 8.30 and then they say it's leaving at 9.30. And when I see that happen, I think it's leaving at 11. And it's something like that with uh, these economic uh, forecasts. So I hope I'm wrong, but my sense is that inflation is going to be a little more sustained than what people are looking for. And my sense uh, also is that it's much harder than many people think to achieve a soft landing because there are all these mechanisms that kick in. At a certain point, uh, consumers run out of their savings, and then you have a Wiley Coyote uh, kind of moment where consumption falls off. At a certain point, people start putting their houses on the market, and then you see house, house prices falling, and then other people rush to put them on the market. At a certain point, you see credit drying up, and when credit dries up, people can't pay back uh, their old, their old uh, borrowing. So there is this proposition, we've talked about it before on the show, David, it's called Psalm's Rule, mm -hmm. that says that when the unemployment rate goes up by half a percent, it goes up by more than 2 percent. And that's because once you get into a negative situation, it, there's an avalanche aspect. And I think we ha have a real risk that that's going to happen at uh, some point. So to continue your airport analogy, when is the plane going to leave? Because we heard Jay Powell this week say, don't pay as much attention to how fast we're going up, because everybody jumped in the fact he was pretty clearly signaling 50 basis points rather than 75. He said, pay attention to the terminal rate. I'm not sure the markets did that. So where do you think the terminal rate is now? Look, I've been saying that relative to the five that's priced into the market, a little below five, I think that's got to be low uh, or likely to be low because I always try to look for possible errors, and four seems almost impossible, and six is certainly a scenario we can write, and that tells me that five is not a good best uh, guess uh, for where it's going to be. In terms of what will happen, I guess I think there's an old saying that things happen faster than you think they will. Uh, so don't happen as fast as you think they will, and then they happen faster than you thought they could. <laughs> and I think that may be the way it is with uh, the downturn. I don't know when it's going to come, but when it kicks in, I suspect it'll be fairly forceful. 
I got an email, as you know, Larry, this week from a loyal viewer of Wall Street, and particularly a loyal viewer of yours, saying, I really love hearing from Larry Summers. And he asked the question. He said, what's so magic about the 2%? I mean, why can't we live with 3% or 4% for that matter? First of all, I think it's important to understand that having failed for a while to hit 2%, it's kind of problematic then to declare that it's no longer our goal, even if it was a somewhat arbitrary goal in the first place. Second, we've already backed away from the 2% in a sense. We've been, for years, well above 2%. And nobody's saying we should swing below 2% so it all averages out to be 2. So in some sense, we're already not really trying for a 2% average inflation target. We're trying for a 2% minimum inflation uh, target. And that's different than what we originally set out to. So we've already eased. Third, if we settle in for a 3% inflation target, then where do we think it's going to go? Presumably, there's going to be a low point of inflation in this cycle, David. And from that low point, it will rise. So saying 3% as a target for what we're disinflating to mm -hmm. isn't saying 3% as an average for uh, the next uh, cycle. So what I think we should do is stay with the 2% uh, target, recognize, in, as I think is surely right, uh, that uh, that's going to be a low point, not uh, an average, but I think that's all right. There was news that went beyond the U.S. economy this week, and it had to do with China. Uh, we had demonstrations at the beginning of the week. They seem to be settling down a little bit because they're easing off on the COVID restrictions. But it's pretty clear that the Chinese economy is struggling some, in part because of those restrictions. Give us a sense of what the risks are there for the global economy because of what's going on in China right now. Look, it's possible that we're going to gain a little strength because it's quite possible that they are going to open up a bit in response to these uh, protests. And then the Chinese economy is going to go faster. And when it goes faster, that will be an impetus to commodity prices. That will help parts of the global economy. I think the challenge for them is that they've only got one-fifth as many intensive care units per person and a third as many nurses as we do per person. And they don't have much immunity. And so it could spread like wildfire and they could have a very scary situation. And that's their tension, really. They can save the economy or they can save their populations uh, near perfect health. But I don't think they're going to be able to do both. Well, and to your point, Larry, it seems to me that we can sit here and say you should ease up some of your COVID restrictions. They have to be data dependent in their own way. It depends on how many infections they get, how many intensive care units are being used. And stuff like that. They may have to adjust their approach. They're surely going to have to adjust. They're surely going to have to titrate uh, their approach uh, over time. And I don't think it's going to be easy. I do think sooner or later they're going to have to do this. And they're not gaining a lot by postponing it. So I think a managed exit from zero COVID is probably the right thing for them to do. And I think the protesters have probably pushed them in that direction. And that's probably a good thing for them and for the global economy. But it's going to be a very rough patch. Finally, Larry, what does this potentially mean for the rest of the economy, uh, the global economy? Because we had David Malpass on this week, and he said he thinks there's going to be recessions in a lot of countries around the world. I think that's fair. I think that is fairly likely, not so much because of what's happening in China, but you got big challenges in China. We've got a good chance of going into recession. Europe's more difficult than we are. Those are the three big poles of the global economy. And if they all slow, others are going to slow along with them. And of course, this is going to be a relatively high interest rate recession, not like the low interest rate recessions we've seen in the past. And that's also going to be problematic for emerging markets. What does that say to the Biden administration? I mean, they've got a new Congress coming in. They're not going to have a majority in the House. If you were there now, if you were back in one of your old jobs in the White House, what is the best economic policy you could pursue, given all the uncertainties and the risks? Look, they've got to execute what they've got in place. It's huge on infrastructure. It's huge on science and uh, technology. They've got to implement that as effectively as they can. And they've got to lead the world in a strong response uh, to all these various uh, global uh, challenges. But they've got their work cut out for them. Can they invest in global health issues? Because you've always been very concerned about that. Look, they, it, the biggest opportunity today 
is to put money into pandemic prevention. Another pandemic is likely to threat, is likely to come within 15 years. And unless we do more, we're not going to be more ready next time than we were last time. Larry, it's so great to have you here and have you here in New York. It's wonderful to be with you. Thank you so much. That is our very special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. Coming up, the one word we never want to hear, but we need to hear every so often, and that is the power of no. That's coming up next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, one more thought. The power of no. All of us like to hear people agree with us, so we're none too happy when people go the other way, when they tell us that we are just plain wrong, like former Vice President Mike Pence recently did to Senator Elizabeth Warren on the subject of abortion counseling. Well, Senator Warren, you couldn't be more wrong. But sometimes being told no is exactly what we need, whether we want it or not. Take, for example, President Putin and his ill-fated decision to invade Ukraine, something that hasn't gone particularly well for him. A bunch of countries are, are watching him make mistake after mistake and not wanting to associate themselves with, as Donald Trump would say, a loser. And people, at least those outside of Russia, suspect Putin's problems are the result of his being surrounded by yes-men. I don't think there's any question that Russian intelligence got this wrong. Or consider the plight of President Xi of China as he enters his historic third term as president. A month ago, he emerged triumphant at the end of his 20th Party Congress with his hand-picked team, as described by Mary Lovely of the Peterson Institute. We now have what we might think of as all the king's men. But this week, President Xi was confronted with demonstrations protesting his zero COVID policy. This is a big deal these um, political protests because they're happening across the country at, at the same time in multiple locations. You just have to wonder whether that hand-picked team is exactly what President Xi needs right now. And when it comes to the power of no, maybe that is exactly what former President Donald Trump could use down at Mar-a-Lago about now, as he managed to hold a dinner party that included Ye, who has been accused of being anti-Semitic, and let him bring along with him a friend who everyone agrees is anti-Semitic. Nick Fuentes avowed Nazi sympathizers, white nationalists, anti-Semite. I mean, like, we could go through the list. And at long last, it looks like Mr. Trump may be getting a taste of no from leaders in his own party, from Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. There is no room in the Republican Party for anti-Semitism or white supremacy. To the likely next Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy. I don't think anybody should be spending any time with Nick Fuentes. He has no place in this Republican Party. To Mr. Trump's former Vice President himself, Mike Pence. I think the President demonstrated uh, profoundly poor judgment uh, in, in giving those individuals a seat at the table. It may not be what we want to hear, but sometimes no is the best answer. That is, if we are listening. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.